revolution, in fact, pushed by mining because coal, iron, um, led to the production of steel and manufacturing, steam power, and introduction of a factory system brought the wealth. So in fact, from the start, this, from the start of the civilization, and throughout the first industrial revolution, mining was one of the great triggers and foremost triggers, in fact. Um, in the second industrial revolution, mining had still contribution, but it, it, the, the raw materials are accompanied by petroleum. And this um, induced um, some other developments like electronic, automobile, rail and uh, road systems, and telecommunication. In the third industrial revolution, which I partly lived, uh, we had, again, coal, petroleum, other raw materials, but we had nuclear energy as well. And this accompanied with microprocessors and electronics, we go into, we made uh, the initial steps of, um, let's say, digital work. So when we come to the fourth industrial revolution, mining is not the trigger, but mining is essential. Bec I'll come to, the point where why mining is essential, um, but third industrial I mean, fourth industrial revolution that is the time that we are living in. We are dealing with disruptive technologies. Those are disruptive because it's changing the way that we are doing the things that we are uh, performing our tasks or performing our jobs and the way that we are conducting engineering. In fact. And what are those technologies when it comes to mining? So it is basically autonomous operations accompanied with AI, virtual augmented mixed reality, uh, personalized training, skill shift needs, big data definitely, um, and big data comes with AI. And all, implementation all these, all, of all these technologies require new safety standards, um, innovations in operations for sustainability, earth, uh, space, and deep, deep sea mining opportunities, um, change in the scale, I'll come to that, and also cryptocurrency, energy transition, and critical minerals. So this critical minerals issue is a huge um, topic because now, all the disruptive technologies um, require a hardware or a middleware. And to have those hardware and middleware, um, you need raw, raw materials. And if you look at, if you check for minerals in an iPhone, you'll come across large number of minerals used for those purposes. And it's the same with self-driving cars or um, autonomous, any autonomous vehicles, lithium ion batteries. Uh, we have here Matt. Matt can talk about this more, I guess. Well, Matt is walk, working for Volkswagen's Critical Mineral Initiative. So every country who are, which are developing um, their um, technology driven um, uh, let's say um, products, they now started establishing critical minerals. So US recently, uh, a few years ago, USGS has published a document and listed critical minerals for US economy. So any country right now developing a technology has this issue of critical minerals because minerals are not distributed equally all over the world. So this uh, dependence on raw materials, especially specific materials over the world, is making mining really, really important. So in fact, you are in an era as young mining engineers that mining will be shining. It was not my time. I graduated in 1992 from 
um, Matthew's mining engineering department. And th by that time, it was the service economy emerging and raw materials were not that much, um, let's say, um, uh, in economic use. And we had really huge rate of unemployment by the time when I graduated in, uh, as a mining engineer. But now, uh, world um, investments in commodities, especially raw materials, require large number of mining engineers. So the question is, how can we develop ourselves in such a way that we can be adopting all these technologies in our professional practice. So here are some examples. Uh, that's, uh, those are the projects that we've been uh, doing at Colorado School of Mines. So the first project started in 2017. It was immediately upon my move to Colorado. So DARPA, Defense Advanced Research um, Program, um, pushes the technology for um, defense purposes, but those are pioneers because DARPA's challenges emerge, uh, World Wide Web emerge, uh, uh, Valodyne-like technologies where you co collect LiDAR data from autonomous vehicles. So this was another challenge and we were asked, I mean, many researchers all over the world are asked to develop uh, sensor technologies and platforms to map underground with 10 centimeter accuracy and detect objects. So we team up at MINES with um, colleagues from computer science and mechanical engineering uh, we call it MINES Multimodal Intelligent Network Exploratory Swarm. So we design a system where swarm of robots um, navigate in underground fully autonomously, no human interaction, and map the underground. So this, is, this was the first attempt to map the underground fully autonomously. And the challenge is still being going on. Uh, we're not continuing, but we're continuing our research in a different direction. This challenge triggered us to develop first a platform, um, develop uh, SLAM, um, underground mapping algorithms and object detection algorithms using AI. And uh, so I'd like to show one of the object detection algorithms that we develop. Um, for you, uh, so why it's not working? <laughs> okay, let me see that. Okay, so now you see, so this is a point cloud data collected from our experimental mine. It's called Edgar Experimental Mine. Uh, you see here the boundaries of the underground opening. We use um, Oyster. Uh, LiDAR sensors, which are mounted on autonomous platform, and our algorithm is autonomously detecting cubes of objects. So those are, we train the AI system for detecting um, human beings. So several human beings are detected uh, in, the, in these cubes. So since LiDAR data is providing a 3D information about uh, the object, um, we, we have a pretty good understanding of the size of the object as well. And then um, we did the same thing with um, RGBD depth camera. So this is um, another application of it when you have sufficient amount of light. Um, so this is the platform that is moving towards our underground mine. And we trained the system with large number of objects for this time, hard hat, fire extinguisher, uh, person. So when uh, the platform is moving and seeing the boundaries of the underground, uh, platform is automatically detecting objects. So this, these platforms also have uh, SLAM algorithms where we, um, when the loop is closed, um, these objects are also located based on their coordinates. So uh, 
Um, this is an, uh, this is a video of our experimental mine. So what, based on the distance and based on the um, the location of our sensor, the sensor is detecting all these objects. Um, so the, with this DARPA challenge, we develop our own system of object detection using uh, several sensors. And we also develop the platform who will, which will um, accompany all these sensors and we develop some virtual reality simulations. So this just to explain what we are doing and how this system will work. So this is the virtual reality of our underground mine and the platform that we develop, this is the design of our platform. And so the platform is crawling initially and seeing the rock blocks and making a decision of flying over. And when there is no obstacle, so these are the, all these, all these decisions are made based on our object detection algorithm. And this platform is now making the decision of crawling because flying is really expensive in terms of um, the, the energy. So that is um, the technology that we've been developing. And this is um, just the seed of this research. Currently, there are huge... Um, operations planning to adopt these kind of technologies so we are using uh, our efforts to advance the technology towards this direction so based on this darpa challenge we realized that we can even de deploy the technology for helping search and rescue and this is a project funded by alpha foundation where we collaborate with the same colleagues and uh, we call it bat vision because we use uh, sensor systems that mimic the bat vision. Um, so the idea is to provide visibility to search and rescue teams while they are in underground by providing real-time mapping in augmented reality. So what we do is that we have this hard hat which is mounted with acoustic and right radar sensors this time and acoustic and radar sensors are really good in detecting uh, underground opening and imagine you have fire and other um, um, let's say obstacles that are blocking the vision search and rescue requires a situational awareness so these sensors are in fact creating real-time map of the underground and sh uh, showing that um, map um, transferred to the augmented reality. So here is an example of real-time mapping. So while you are walking, um, the, the mesh of the underground is created um, and so this is an example of, again, an experiment we conduct, conducted in our underground maps, uh, underground mine. And the colors are showing the type of the material. So if you have sufficient sensors, you can even uh, classify the objects based on their um, material characteristics. So the system at the end will look like this. So while you are navigating in underground, um, so the, the mine it will be definitely filled with uh, some smoke and maybe you have dust. And while you are navigating in underground, you may have no visibility. Even though you don't have no visibility, you can still see the meshes and you can still navigate. So that's the prototype of the system, and we are expecting the system to be operational in in a year. We we are just in the middle of the project, and we are now evaluating which visualization methods will be good for search and rescue uh, people that are operating in underground. So the other um, issue that we will deal with in future will be um skill shift because 
um, we train mining engineers and also miners based on the um, existing knowledge of engineering. But in fact, the whole process is, has been changing. Uh, the interesting thing is that industry, the change in the industry and people's adoption of technology is much higher than the change in educational institutes. Um, we've been still teaching more or less the same topics for a long period of time. But in fact, in this industrial revolution period, period, we need an accelerated change. And for these um, accelerated change, large number of uh, people has to be trained, large number of workforce in fact has to be trained. In US, it is predicted that 75 million workers will be displaced or requiring retraining. And also, due to energy transition, low carbon economy, um, most of the coal mines are closing. For example, in between 2010 and 2018, um, 30,000 miners became unemployed. It's a known fact. We know that these people will be unemployed, but this doesn't mean that they cannot contribute to the economy. They can still contribute, but they need to develop new skills. So the question is, how can we accelerate sh skill shift needs by training uh, using the new technologies? Um, first of all, although we are uh, infusing some new technologies in our educational practice, not all the minds are adopting this. So there is, an, uh, there is a huge number of experienced engineers working in um, the conventional mining operation. When all these mining operations are changing, they need to be trained. Second is that uh, young mining engineers, they have less experience, they are tech savvy, but they also need to understand um, the nature of mining. As, as you all know, mining um, contains a lot of uncertainties. If you have large amount of uncertainty in, in, in engineering, you use your engineering judgment because that's the only way that you can effectively manage it. So the question is, how are we gonna train the workforce so that the industry will have uh, an effective transition. So for this, uh, we started a project um, um, supported by NSF. Um, and we are covering not only raw materials, raw materials is presented by mining, but we are covering uh, raw materials, steel and advanced manufacturing. So what we are developing is that we are developing an AI system here. Uh, this AI system will take um, experience, personal skills, and also look at the job and skill shift needs that are emerged in the uh, industry and will provide personal training needs for each employee. Because, you know, uh, tailor made um training modules is not effective while you are training uh people who have different experiences different backgrounds this different ambition so we are in the second stage of this proposal of this project where we develop uh needs from the industry uh, we identify key features of skill shift needs in the industry and uh, we started developing the, um, the AI system. In the second phase, we will accompany this AI system with some training modules and see if, um, if such uh, training modules are effective for personalized training. Th this, along with this proposal, uh, we have another proposal. Uh, uh, with this project, we have another project which is supported by Boeing, where we are developing some online modules, um, including some virtual reality and augmented reality modules to meet the needs of aviation and advanced manufacturing industry. So it's all industries, in fact, but in mining, we have uh, an urgent need for this transformation. 
And here is an example of a uh, virtual reality-based training. So here the user is asked to assess whether there will be a roof fall hazard in underground and she is selecting yes. And then based on this, the software is providing uh, an displacement amount around the underground opening. So there is a numerical model running behind this. And then um, user is asked to select um, certain bolt uh, pattern. So she's selecting the bolt pattern and the length. Then the bolts are, bolts will be installed. She's gonna see that. Yeah, bolts are installed. You can see the bolts. Um, and she's investigating the underground and then she will go higher up. There isn't here a block that may fail. So she's also investigating what are the changes in the expected displacement. So we have a numerical model running behind this. So she's going up and seeing if this block here is properly um, supported and she will later on see uh, stress distribution around the underground opening. Yeah, here is the stress distribution. She will even see um, what are the displacement vectors on the face. So this is in fact um, training modules we've been working at MINES. So if you are interested in involving in these kind of projects, just let me know. We can share um, all these data. I am the defender of open source, so all these data will be open source. Problem is that they are so big, um, sharing is requires some resources. Um, so the next issue is that, okay, we have all these transformations, we increase, and we need that transformation because uh, uh, ore grades are getting lower. We have to extract the deeper, min, um, deeper deposits, and um, competition is getting really severe. So you need um, cost reduction, which is fine. Everything is okay, but mining also has some controversy in the society because there is a huge opponent. Uh, developing in different societal contexts. And if you look at the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals, all the industries have to report their contribution to sustainable development. And mining finds its uh, contribution to sustainable development with increasing the welfare via employment, for example. And if we are automating all these minds, um, it's, I mean, it's not expected that we will have fully autonomous minds in 2050. We will definitely have human beings in the loop, but they will have different rules, different roles in the system. So the question is, how are we going to um, provide employment in the local communities? And if you, this is, um, this chart is Ernst & Young's um, top 10 mining um, and metal um, sectors risk. Every year they are publishing these risks and this year, if you see here, future of workforce rise from seven to two. Even uh, last year, so and this year it is social license to operate is an issue and license to operate was again the first most important issue um, between 2019 and 2020. So as you see, um, social license to operate is also changing the style of mining. How it's changing is that first, um, if you look at the mining life cycle, um, impact of mining in different mine cycle is different. Second is that um, initially we've been teaching um, 
mining as a kind of a scale um, related um, engineering um, uh, discipline because if you increase the scale um, you have higher profits but in fact right now there is a limit to scale because what what will be the uh, what will be the size of truck that you use in a mining operation at most? How can we increase the size more and more? That's an issue because there is a limit for this size. Second is that if you increase the size, the impact is also increasing, especially the footprint is increasing. Uh, and also its contribution to the economy is changing. For example, recently there are several mines which are about to close um, around Colorado as those mines are providing huge tax benefits to local communities. They didn't decide to close immediately. They reduced the production and expand the closure so that community will have some time to uh, develop new uh, skills, new areas, and the mining company is also developing a lot of challenges to promote new ideas of economic development. So the main change, main game changer um, in the mining systems are definitely disruptive technologies, but also the society, because society is also a new constraint and even in our senior design or mind design classes, we are now adding social license to operate as a constraint in a design problem where um, society's, society's needs are considered um, in the design process. And sustainable development, um, contribution to sustainable development um, is not an easy, uh, tangible, um, let's say, um, tangible phenomena that you can measure. And you remember in the beginning, I, I said to you that we still have artisanal scale mining. Yes, we have. And in fact, a large portion of the gold resources in the world is coming from artisanal small scale mining in Peru, Colombia, and other um, parts of the world. So this artisanal small-scale mining uh, with large uh, amount of production um, has also some involvement in um, illicit activities. So basically, although there is a term called green gold, you never know at which point this gold is mixed with um, uh, with a gold that is produced by some illicit gold supply chain. So we are in fact developing a new um, method where we develop a systems dynamic approach to understand um, not only the gold production, but its, its whole supply chain. So Abdul Munam is here, he developed um, this chart. This is a preliminary analysis of the supply chain and I am working with um, an anthropologist from our department that's Dr. Smith and we have uh, Dr. Flaman from the Department of Economics, me and Greg from Payne Institute where we will develop um, not only the mathematical model but also develop some policies to deal with the illicit gold supply chain. So it is, mining is now more fun than ever because although, first of all, it's because we have uh, lots of interdisciplinary work that has to be done. I consider this as a fun. Second is that engineers, as engineers, we like challenges. So we have more challenges. So it's a, it's a fun thing that you come across more challenges and then you improve your engineering skills by dealing with those challenges. Um, the last but not the least, uh, it's big data. Uh, it's been 
there for a long period of time. But I'd like to caution you about this uh, big data aspect. Um, big data without having AI means nothing. So you need to, you need to develop infrastructure methods to obtain value from the data. And currently, because of the energy transition and critical mineral issues, um, there, is, um, there is a need for discovery of critical minerals, exploration of critical minerals. So there we, um, we have new technologies. It's not only the big data, but also um, satellite technologies that are producing the big data. Uh, and also subsurface uh, data that is coming from geophysical surveys. So we are currently running a project where we, com where we combine um, satellite images with subsurface data so that we understand uh, the geology and the formation of an ore deposit. And if we, if we can train our AI system based on this, we can still use that AI system for exploration of other minerals. So that's the other project that has been going on. Um, I haven't mentioned the projects that I have been doing uh, from the start of my career. Those are in fact related to geotech and rock mechanics. Um, those projects are implementing big data and AI. For example, I have one student who is um, collecting images of the roof of underground openings and training a system and trying to figure out roof all hazards. So those are in fact implications of big data and AI in preparation for autonomous operations. Um, and it involves understanding of rock behavior, rock mass behavior, rock mechanics, and uh, structure. So if you have any questions, I can definitely answer these. Uh, but with the push from the industry for adaptation of uh, fourth industrial revolution, that research is slowly going as compared to the new research topics that we've been working on this. Um, so before finishing my talk, um, I'd like to make some recommendations for all of you. So, I mean, engineering in this era is a continuous learning process. And with the new technologies coming up, uh, don't be uh, an engineer who is observing all these technologies, but involve in development of those technologies. In my time, it was really difficult, like, because you need to learn huge amount of computer science, um, uh, image analysis, uh, data analytics. But in this time of, uh, in this time of engineering, accessing the tools uh, are really easy. Training yourself are really, really easy. And if you need any guidance or any, um, uh, let's say, suggestions, recommendations from me, you can always approach to me and ask. So now uh, that is the end of my presentation and I'm opening the session for your questions. Uh, so what you can do is that you can unmute yourself and say who you are and ask your questions. And I will stop uh, sharing the screen. I'll be with you with my video. Oops. Yeah. So, oops, oh, I am not seeing the video. So this is, uh, again, I can put myself in our virtual underground model. Um, so Eran, you are sharing your video. You are muted. So any questions?
Görkem. By the way, uh, we probably lots of questions, but uh, I think they can ask in Turkish. Sure. Yeah, I should I should mention that you can always ask questions in Turkish, and I can translate for the ones who cannot understand Turkish. Yeah, please speak in Turkish if you want. So I was so clear for everyone. <laughs> so if you don't have any questions, um, I will say goodbye to everyone. Artun, would you like to say anything? Uh, hocam, belki ben bir soru sorabilirim. Sure. Ee, malumunuz hocam burada e, çok fazla e, lisans ve yüksek lisans hatta yeni mezun aralarında işlerinde bulunduğu arkadaşlarımız var. E, büyük bir çoğunluğunda zaten optimadan mühendisliğinden mezun arkadaşlar oluşturuyor. E, ve hani 4.0 hani endüstri 4.0 e, kapsamında sektörü biraz ele aldınız. E, bu anlamda e, biraz da disiplinin e, çok e, çok disiplinli bir alan olmamızdan kaynaklı olarak şeylerden bahsettiniz. Hani bu anlamda mesela önerebileceğiniz zaten kısaca bahsettiniz ama hani yazılı mıdır tek yol yoksa e, data analytics midir hani ya da image analysis gibi şeylerdir çünkü lisans düzeyinde özellikle bunların çok fark edilmemesi de ben oldukça doğal düşünüyorum ama siz ne düşünürsünüz bilmiyorum. So Artem is asking what are my recommendations for improving your personal skills? Um, along the needs of fourth industrial revolution. Did I um, effective or did I translate it correctly? Artem? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Okay, Thank you. Great. So, um, in fact, you know, um, in undergraduate education, we have, uh, we have uh, some courses that are related to programming. So for that programming is the software development and all these things um, are really easy. So you, you should definitely have some understanding of coding. Um, second is that you should have definitely have someone, you should have definitely have some understanding of data analytics. It doesn't matter whether it's an image data or whether it is an data coming from an IoT uh, sensor or set of sensors that are related to maintenance, for example. You know, big mostly big, big data applications in mining are related to um, um, predictive maintenance, for example. But whatever the case, I mean, image or sensor data or even uh, social media data, um, idea is to extract information from from this data set. So there are certain principles of knowledge discovery. This is called data analytics. So I would strongly recommend everyone to understand um, um, those methods. I'm not calling them machine learning and AI because machine learning and AI is not new. People think that this is new. No, it's not new. Uh, even when I was graduated in 1992, I was using these methods and learning these methods. Only the name change. In, um, in 90s, it was statistics. In 2000s, it was called uh, data mining. And um, in, after 2000, it started to be called as machine learning in AI. And AI is in fact uh, leverage with deep learning. There are several tools that you can learn, but important thing is to understand how to extract data, how to extract information from the data. Um, and also understanding um, all these processes requires interacting with other disciplines. 
So establish good communication skills so that you can understand other disciplines um, um, perspectives that you can always incorporate, always team with them. I am sure that uh, Middle East Technical University is providing all these skills. Um, all you need is to uh, learn how to implement these in mining problems. The other aspect that I haven't mentioned is uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. Now mining is discovering um, the need for innovation. There are um, huge mining companies investing in innovation uh, in different ways. Uh, innovation requires diversity. So be open to all kinds of um, ideas, listen people, because they will definitely inspire you. You probably have all these skills, but um, knowing that in future you, you will need more skills, be open to learn. And uh, I would start with developing some skills on use of certain uh, software tools, not only Excel, okay. <laughs> We all know how Excel plays a role in mining engineering, but it's not Excel anymore, okay? Yeah, any other questions? Thank you, Ujam. By the way, uh, we have uh, questions from Mike and Mustafa, Jan and Paray. Uh, sure. They are asking from chat. Sure. I, Mark, why I cannot see the chat? I mean, uh, if yeah. you want, I can. Read. Yeah, yeah. You are the co-host. Uh, maybe it's going to you. Sure. Please go okay. ahead. Okay. Uh, Mike is asking, what are your views on mining companies that are wondering about the readiness of autonomous technology for them to fully transition to, to transition their entire fleets to uh, to autonomous one? Can, can you, you repeat the beginning? I I missed the beginning okay. part uh -huh. of it. What are your views on mining companies that are oh. wondering about the readiness of autonomous technology for them to fully transition their entire place to an uh, autonomous one? Okay. Uh, in terms of ambition, they are ready. They are so ambitious. But in terms of transformation, there is a huge confusion, uncertainty about the process. Um, Mining, as you know, it's a very conservative, um, let's say, um, industry due to, due to its nature because there are ups and downs. It's a cyclic industry. So uh, people or the industry that are taking risks are always following uh, each other. So they are waiting for someone, for example, it, it's Rio Tinto who took the initiative and Fortescue had some um, fully autonomous mines, but um, there, although there is a huge ambition to have that transformation, um, the a, a structure where they can easily adopt that transformation is not um, well established. Second is that industry um, don't have uh, interoperability, uh, fully interoperable systems, because in, in mining operation, you need also the past information, past data, and, um, and currently systems are um, not fully interoperable. Uh, that's, and that's another aspect that are not making mining companies immediately go to uh, that transformation. There are also failures and those failures are making a bit reluctant to ex uh, accept this. But there is a kind of a consensus that they will go into that direction soon. Problem is they don't know how to do that. So as young engineers, for example, um, you can develop, you can actively involve in those processes and um, do um, uh, do some uh, developments along this line. Uh, mining companies are also reluctant with interacting 
um, reluctant to interacting with um, uh, research research institutes like us. Um, for example, we have a great um, uh, interaction with DARPA because DARPA knows uh, the human resources and uh, the, the capacity we have. So it's opening up these kind of, um, um, let's say, challenges to everyone. So this is in fact triggering uh, other resources, uh, other research as well. Um, but such mechanism does not exist in mining companies. They basically want to solve um, many problems within themselves or with some consultancy companies. But now we are in a really, really complex situation uh, where universities, consultancy companies, and mining companies have to work together in large teams, not in a small group of people that they are trying to have that adaptation. I hope I answered your question, Mike. If not, uh, go ahead with other questions. Now, what are the other questions, Artun? Uh, I'm looking, uh, Mustafa Jan has a question. Uh, by the way, Mike, uh, say thank you. Uh, oh, Mustafa okay. Jan has a problem with microphone uh, and he's asking, uh, I saw that your team developed the object detection algorithm. Uh, I wonder that uh, what kind of biases did you face while you are developing it? Sometimes it recognized the power box as a person. So what is the main challenge while solving this kind of errors in the underground? Because underground has a chaotic nature itself. It is, in fact, yeah, I mean, this is just an example of it. What you do is that you train the system. Uh, oh, okay, I had another question. But you train the system with large number of data, okay? And um, we are working on this. You definitely have uh, certain errors, like in the order of 95%. So you also have human beings in the loop to manage all these errors. Um, but in terms of emergency, in terms of providing situational awareness uh, for search and rescue and other operations, those errors are not that big. Uh, you can still implement the method. So recent AI technologies um, is based on large data sets and training the data, uh, training the system with large data sets. For example, Google's ImageNet uh, trained the system over 1 million of cars okay so in, it doesn't matter whether you are in underground or surface if you are in a complex environment you need large number of data sets to train the system unfortunately since mining companies are not sharing the data uh, not sharing um, those you know sensor uh, information we have to create this on our own of course we cannot like as a researcher I cannot reach up to 1 million um, human beings in underground and train the system right so this is a start and in fact this requires a collaboration between several institutes um, because all these systems are developed by um, containing um, or merging existing data in the work. So a successful implementation of AI definitely requires um, merging large number of data sets collected from mining um, scenes. Uh, and it's a discussion, it's something related to Mike's question because if you don't share, if you keep everything for yourself, um, you also block the development of accurate technologies. So if you have data, you can definitely improve it. Thank you, Hojam. Uh, we have one more question too. Uh, yeah. Barai uh, asking, what are the thoughts about space mining in Colorado? And what, uh, what do you suggest about students uh, who wants to work research in these areas? Um, so Colorado School of Mines has the first program, uh, first graduate program dedicated to, to space resources. 
it's the first in the world. And we have a program. Uh, if you are interested, I can share the talk that I made NASA last year about space mining. We have some research on this as well. And that research, I mean, my research is developing AI for uh, image-based um, um, operations. And currently, um, space mining is more focused on uh, mining in, um, in the moon, lunar technologies. And developing uh, a lunar mining technology requires um, a drilling technology and adaptive, adaptive technology where certain uh, excavation systems uh, adapt based on um, the lunar regolith, for example. Um, so that is an emerging area. We have large number of students all over the world. Um, so space mining, it's primitive what it's developing. Um, if you are interested, you can go to the Colorado School of Mines Space Resources Program and um, uh, have, um, have a look at the program. Program is fully online. Uh, you're not supposed to be here. Um, yeah, it's emerging, definitely. Thank you, Ojan. Uh, we have uh, one question from a different perspective. Uh, Jamal Dursun asking, what do you think are the legal challenges that will like to come along with the fourth revelation of mining? Yeah, it is in fact uh, a really interesting question and thanks for um, asking this question because this allowed me to go into the details of it. Um, as you see, industrial revolution is changing the society. So we cannot go on with the existing legal, uh, let's say, um, system. We need to improve it. And how we should improve this, we don't know it yet, but I can give you some signs of it. Uh, for example, if you have human beings in the loop that are working with autonomous systems, we definitely need new safety standards, new safety protocols. Um, a few years ago, there was one engineer who was uh, killed by robots in one of the Volkswagen factories. So this is a real danger. The other aspect is that how human beings will interact with the robots. There is a new era, a new area emerging. It's called uh, ethical aspects of AI and um, ethics in autonomy. And um, those research areas, I believe, will lead to development of um, changes in the legal system. Definitely it will come. It should come because um, if we are talking about changes in the society, we definitely need to think about its legal and ethical aspects. It, it is definitely related with safety and security so if you're talking about safety and security, it goes to, it's, it's uh, highly linked with, um, with um, legal and, um, and some regulatory aspects. So we, there should be definitely um, a legal um, and regulatory changes coming, especially for space mining, for example, there are uh, people especially policymakers, they are working on legal aspect of it. To give you an example from our illicit gold supply chain project, for example, we have uh, in, in our project, we have people from um, uh, law schools and uh, uh, criminologists uh, looking at the problem from their perspective. So definitely they have to be in the loop. Thank you, Jam. Uh, I I take lots of questions from uh, some of the participation participants, and uh, you guess uh, one wondering question. Uh, undergraduate students uh, are wondering uh, how can I go to uh, abroad as a researcher or uh, postdoc or uh, master degree. Um. So I don't know the other um, 
let's say, countries. Uh, I mean, I know the Canada and Australia. Um, there are a few f- number of um, departments in Europe, basically in Germany. Um, so in different countries, the undergraduate education system uh, is different and the graduate system is also different. So in US, our undergraduate student um, population is um, dependent on our research projects. So if I, if I hire, for example, a, an undergraduate student, I should have a research project. Currently, I have a large number of students that are all working in those projects that I mentioned to you. Um, but mostly, we prefer to hire PhD students. So I would, if you want to apply for, uh, for a US higher education, I would recommend you to have a master's degree and apply for a PhD. Um, because usually it's, um, it's not economic for us to hire um, a master's student because we want students to work longer term in our projects and produce more. That's the main idea. And it's the same in Australia and Canada. Um, most of the time, um, faculty has projects and they look for students who would like to hire. So they have to approach to people who have um, those research projects. We sometimes make an announcement. There are some difficulties to approach to students sometimes because I last summer I was looking for a postdoc and I specifically wanted someone from Turkey, especially from METU, because I know uh, students' ambition, students' um, background. That, that's why I wanted to work. But I never had any applicant from it. So, I mean, there is kind of a disconnect between uh, what we're looking for and what other people are looking for. But my sincere suggestion is to apply for PhD. Thank you, Ozan. Uh, by the way, uh, Ozan Evkaya has a question and want to ask uh, myself. Şimdi hocam, merhabalar, teşekkürler. Ee, bir merhaba demek istedim önce Türkçe. Uzun zamandır görmemiştim sizi bu bahane <gülüyor> vesile oldu. Ee, biraz tabii alan itibariyle çok yakında değilim bu işlerin ama gene de dinlemek istedim. Aa, Soruyu da... Sen Ozan? Efendim? Sen necisin? Ee, ben Hangi matematik bilmiyorum? mezunuydum. Şimdi Aha. istatistikte bitirdim doktoramı. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, Ozan, you you you studied math and statistics, okay? Ee, genel bir soru soracağım, İngilizce soracağım, hani Mike içinde. Uh, I'm just wondering about your opinions about uh, the graduates of mathematics students uh, in the new industrial revolution in the fourth one. Uh, you mentioned okay. a little bit engineering, uh, but uh, I believe that the, you know, the course program is not so uh, updated for uh, new era, I guess. And this is a, a kind of a practical one for me since we will make a uh, meeting, online meeting for the med students in Ankara from another university, uh, Atalum University. Uh, I'm just wondering your opinions for the future of math graduates. And yeah, okay, you know, engineering is an applied science. <laughs> so without having basic science, engineering is nothing, you know? So we definitely need basic scientists. It's not only math, we need chemistry, physics, even basic social scientists, anthropology, <coughs> excuse me. Um, <coughs> Uh, anthropology, sociology, and psychology, and other basic sciences. So, and for for engineer, I mean, to to find a connection between basic science and engineering, there are applied um, sciences that are emerging from math. So for example, you said statistics. Yeah, statistics is emerging from math. But whatever the case, without having math 
especially in computational sciences, um, we cannot operate. You know, for example, if you want to develop an AI system, an AI algorithm, we are using existing ones, but what we need smart maths to improve uh, the computational performance, for example. So um, um, math has great feature to me in terms of fourth industrial revolution, but um, people who are uh, working in those fields would probably don't have access to industry needs. Uh, for example, most of the um, um, most of the oil and gas companies in the U.S. hire math and physics um, graduates because they need that kind of basic research. It's the same in mining, but mining is a bit far behind what's going on um, in geosciences. So, and but if you're talking about deep sea mining, space mining, we should definitely need more math and physics. So it's in inevitable. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And also, you know, you don't you don't worry about the modernization of uh, uh, the curriculum. I mean, I was thinking while I was in Turkey, we could be more progressive. We could we could teach this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. But what I realize in today's world is that even though you may not have that background. You can always develop this. So you don't need to worry about this. You know, if the, the important thing is that you have to be good in, in one field, okay? Mm -hmm. I did th that amount of interdisciplinary research. I didn't tell you uh, my other research, which is, which is not in mining, but other fields. But all these research applications are coming from my experience and my background in, uh, in my specific field. So I would recommend everyone to be in good and really good in depth in a certain area and you can always navigate to other areas um, to learn more. So just be ambitious to learn more, that's all. Don't worry about what you are given in educational institutes. Okay, I see, thank you. So other questions? Uh, Hojam, I don't see uh, new questions, but uh, I see some names, uh, some alumni from our de departments. Uh, they are currently working on Europe and uh, there are many of friends uh, from LSR Gold, uh, on a Gold in Turkey and uh, First Quantum Minerals. Maybe uh, they can, uh, they want to contribute and Onur Hoca is uh, with us. Yeah, I, I've seen him. Uh, Gülşah oh, Hocam, I, duyuyor musunuz wait. sesimi? Duyuyorum, Onur ne haber? How are you? İyiyim hocam, nasılsın, nasıl, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, yeah, thanks. Uh, nice to see you on the screen. <laughs> ben, ben, ben eating our dinner at home. Nice to, see, uh, nice to host you uh, in our home. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I missed the, the first part because uh, I was thinking that the, the talk will be in the other platform. But yeah, I, I was thinking the same way. <laughs> it's technology. Yeah. It's our fault. Okay. okay, thank you. See you. Yeah, uh, Gusha was asking. Yeah, raising cans. Hello. Jump. First of Gusha, all. Albert. Good to see <laughs> you. <laughs> I'm good, thanks. Thanks for asking. <laughs> it's really good to see you. Uh, I would like to contribute uh, to the question of the students, undergraduate students. I'm currently making my master in Europe uh, in resources engineering field. I can suggest uh, my undergraduate friends to research about EIT label master program uh, to make their master in Europe and they can have good uh, scholarship opportunities also. And uh, we are studying resources engineering in the circular economy concept, but uh, I would like to ask you, uh, what is the 
opinions of Colorado School of Mine or the uh, American mining companies on the circular economy concept? Yeah, Gülşah, that's a really good question. Thanks for asking. Um, circular economy is only considered uh, when the tailings are an issue, you know, because by nature, it's not possible to have a total, totally developed circular economy within mining concepts. But some mining companies are dealing with, for example, zero uh, waste that would be considered as a circular but not in the, uh, the exact meaning of circular economy um there are some research going on uh recycling uh tailings within the circular economy concept um and the recent ta tailing dam failures um also pushed the industry to do a lot of research in um tailings management so this is uh somehow related to circular economy, but full circular economy um, context, to, to my view, is not possible for mining. Since you are, um, you are an expert in, in that field, maybe you can provide your views, Grusha? Uh, for me, uh, rather than mining, we are studying in the processing for the yes. circular economy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, because uh, in mining, it's not possible. <laughs> uh, if we can uh, combine mining with other uh, disciplines, maybe we can uh, develop or improve the circular economy concept. But in Europe and in the United States, I know there are lots of critical uh, raw materials and there are lots of feature research uh, are going on. Uh, I, I would like to also ask you uh, the coronavirus, uh, how did it affect the uh, raw material policy? Um, I mean, it's not the subject, but since uh, industrial revolution is uh, developing, we will need uh, more raw material. And we are taking, at least Europe is taking most of them from China uh, and United States also uh, is taking a lot of raw materials from China and we need raw, more raw material. Uh, how did coronavirus uh, virus situation affect the industrial revolution in case of uh, raw materials? Can we comment? Sure, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's gonna be my personal comment. Of course, US is, it's not only US, like US, Germany, Japan, those are the technology providers in the world have established their own critical mineral list. And in the US, there is a new program in Department of Energy and other departments to develop new resources. So there is a huge exploration program related to, um, to, to critical minerals. So everyone, I mean, most of the, um, um, let's say technology providers are trying to diversify their raw material um, uh, supply um, by finding new uh, methods of it. But if you look at the need, I mean, the demand in the world, circular economy will not be any, any um, solution. I mean, circular economy is definitely good. I'm not against this, but in terms of uh, the demand, um, the amount of recovery will not be meeting the meeting the demand. So we definitely need new resources. Um, in COVID-19, um, most of the mining companies uh, were um, in operation because it's considered to be critical uh, industry. Um, but you know, mining companies are global. They have operations all over the world. So some of them have to stop their operations. I know operations in Africa and operations in South America um, are stopped because governments ask to stop it. And in Canada as well, some of the operations um, stop. Um, but this is, I, I see this is in uh, temporary, it's gonna definitely come back because um, economy will recover 
um, most interesting to me was um, negative <laughs> oil prices, <laughs> which was uh, amazing. We never had thought of it. Um, but this is also an interesting um, issue because petroleum industry, in fact, made a revolution and made a huge innovation in their uh, processes with uh, unconventional um, methods. And, you know, this unconventional method is horizontal drilling technologies with fracking. And this made huge amount of recovery in uh, unexploitable reserves. But that innovation requires a continuous production whenever you, you and this is designed in an economical um, framework where there is a uh, demand all the time. Um, I think mining industry has to think of these kind of scenarios. Um, the good thing with the mining industry is that we haven't come to that position, like we have the continuous demand all the time, but it may come. Um, the other thing is that mining industry, apart from adopting those digital technologies, didn't make a huge groundbreaking um, uh, innovation. We still drilled last hole. You know, uh, there are solution mining, definitely this, we may consider this as a kind of an uh, innovation, but it's not applicable. You know, in all mining operations, we still have the same unit operations. Um, so um, I, with the COVID, I guess, uh, with those in, uh, disruptions, um, because mining is highly impacted from those disruptions, there are going to come new solutions, definitely. Um, but I think we need more progressive approach in mining, um, diversity, um, outsiders' views to the industry, and an open, um, let's say, discussion within the industry, um, an exchange of some technologies uh, would be needed. Yeah. I hope I answered your question, Lusha. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Uh, uh, Hojam, yep. I was just checking chat session uh, and I can't see no more questions. Are there any questions? I suppose not. Hey. Okay, so when you when you have no, the record uh, recording of sorry, this, sorry for interruption. Okay. Inter interruption, jump. Uh, Burju, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry for um, just getting in. Shabnam, um, jump. I'm Burju. Hi, Burju. Burju. You're from Sweden, right? No, you're connecting from Sweden. Yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add up one thing before if it was like closing up. Um, that for like PhDs and postdocs, I wanted to add that Nordic countries have similar approach as US, Canada or Australia. When you have a project, then the, um, the person who comes up with the project uh, opens a position. So it's possible to follow it on the websites and I wanted to add it if anyone is interested. Sounds good, yeah. Yeah, but also I want, like, I um, I think it was my last year as bachelor, so I came to your office and talked about my future plans and asked for some advice. And the best advice that you have given that I haven't listened was you told me to work before I start a master's degree. <laughs> because I was so unsure. And you were so right that I, like, I don't regret, but it would have been far better if I started working and then after a couple of years come back to master's in the topic that I would like to do. So I think it's, if you are unsure, it would apply to anyone who is willing to do a master's right after bachelor's right now. Thanks, Burju. That's a, it, that's a good confirmation of what I'm predicting. <laughs> and um, thank you for today by the way, for the ones who are arranging and thank you for uh, sharing your 
<clears throat> um, thoughts about the issues, the current issues that are bothering us. Yeah, it was great pleasure to see you and talk to you uh, in this environment. I'd love to see you more. Uh, so keep me informed um, whenever you need any help or any other um, meeting. I, I will definitely um, contribute. Good. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ojam. Um, finally, uh, we are about to close. Uh, we are so sorry for troubles which is caused by us. Caused by us. Uh, thank you for your participation. Uh, see you at the upcoming webinars. Thank sure. you. Have a great night, I guess, right? Here it's uh, morning, but you're there. It's night. Yeah. Um, for the ones that are from Europe, it's probably afternoon. So enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you have a nice weekend. Bye.